you'll have to forgive me for making another long video so recently, but uh, I've had a lot of thoughts today about things in general, and I'm too weak of constitution to, to write it, so I, I'll just make this and maybe save it for later. But, um, yeah, so I guess what got me kind of started thinking in this whole line of things is I was just looking at my bookshelves like I normally do sometimes, just looking at everything, just seeing what I have and imagining about it. And I looked on my shelf that's right next to my bed here, which has all my modernist stuff and all my favorites. And just out of the corner of my eye, I saw this essay collection, uh, Essays and Addresses, by Robert Musil, called Precision and Soul. Which I really enjoy, and I haven't read in a while. But I remember he writes about um, The Mathematical Man, which is a, a good essay. He writes about... Um, on Stupidity, which is a very good essay, but one I hadn't read, oh, also Ruminations of a Slow-Witted Mind, that's good too, um, but one I hadn't read, at least I didn't read the whole thing, is The Serious Writer in Our Time, and uh, before I go into that, I'll just say briefly uh, where this title came from, Precision and Soul. There's a quote here. There is an abiding miscommunication between the intellect and the soul. We do not have too much intellect and too little soul, but too little intellect in matters of the soul. And that that must be true. It obviously is. Because when you look at speaking broadly, philosophy or mathematics or physics or things. Um, you know, the closer physics gets to our brain, it completely messes up. As far as, you know, physics, yeah, you know, we have it down pretty good. There's still huge gaps. And then you go to chemistry, which is, you know, we seem to have it down pretty good. And you go to biology, it gets a little more hairy. And then when you go to psychology or sociology, you have no one has any idea what's happening, really. And you know economics even more so. And that's it's very unusual. But uh, I think that would constitute matters of the soul. And this is speaking from someone who really doesn't know anything about mathematics. But I've always had the impression that mathematics really their goal in the end is in a sense self-discovery or exploration of the mind because as far as I can tell <laughs> the world doesn't have any mathematics it's you know f functionally chaotic and um, most of the rules we see are ones that our brain puts on, on the world. Now there are really interesting things like uh, Paul Dirac got really into these numbers that couldn't be uh, couldn't be distilled anymore. And I can't pluck a good example out, but it's like numbers that cannot be derived anymore or, you know, however you want to say it, which is a very interesting talk by him on YouTube about it. I'm sure if you search Paul Dirac, it'll come up. But, um... Yeah, I, uh... I've had a lot of Richard Feynman on my mind recently. I've been reading, rereading the beginning of The Man Without Qualities, 
And I think before I get into all that stuff, I want to read the section from uh, Precision and Soul, the, the section, the serious writer in our time. So uh, he begins by talking about the serious writer and about today. And because I'm speaking about the serious writer and about today, the beginning is easy, because I can confidently claim that we don't know what either one is. Perhaps I may explain this first as, it's concern, as it concerns the serious writer. Some years ago, I published a trifle in which I described what great moral, but also what great economic significance is owed to the assumption that somewhere there is such a thing as the serious writer. Publishing houses and the book trade, printers, binders, and paper factories, copy editors and uh, feuilleton pages of newspapers, theater and film, offices that dispatch manuscripts, offices that dispatch matrices for printing, offices that dispatch... <laughs> illustrations, governmental, supervisory, and administrative offices, the hiring of secondary school and university teachers, cartels, unions, libraries, and their personnel, and not least the existence of remunerative scribbling for entertainment. This enormous and unbounded edifice erected above writing and reading, which assures so many people of an adequate or a lavish livelihood, rests entirely on maintaining the feeling of being in the service of some great cause. Without this feeling, for without this feeling, not nearly so many people could read with a light heart the bad books they prefer, and in doing so make reading a worthy part of the life of our nation. In this endeavor, nobody has any idea who is really a superior writer, if one inflates the notion to correspond to such grand importance and nobody know what a serious writer is. Oh, man. I cut that in half, and it sounds ridiculous. Imagine Robert Musil walking up to you and saying, and nobody know what a serious writer is. All right. So, uh, and, and continuing on. There are among the living perhaps a dozen such Karyatids, supporting on their shoulders a monstrous economic apparatus. The exact number doesn't matter, but it is certain that these writers don't, for the most part, feel it all right about holding it up. They are recognized by only a relatively small circle of initiates. In several well-known instances, their income is that of beggars. And the greatest paradox is that everything that lives off them seems to have made it its business to kill them off as quickly as possible. It is on account of these parasites that some undeserving writers receive prizes and that radio networks arrange homages for others. This was most clearly expressed by a lady who disseminates culture by arranging public gatherings. When she was once asked how it happened that she had passed over a particular poet, since helping him ought really to have been close to her heart, what can I tell you, she replied. I have such sensitive feelings. He upsets me. Is this description an exaggeration? It expresses a truth so naked that it deserves to be forbidden, at least by law against nudity, if no other. And he goes on to say other very interesting ideas. But, uh, well, you know, all of, all of it's very, very interesting. And... I, I also think that I, I think that exact same thing that, you know, the idea, what is it? Oh yeah. In uh, Enrique Villa Matas, his book, Dublin-esque, the main character is a publisher an editor trying to find the, the, the masterpiece or the, the genius of the time. And he never finds it. That's, that's one of the main driving points of the book. He never finds the the James Joyce he never finds the William Gaddis and he tries so hard and that it makes him extremely distressed first of all that he can't write it and second of all that he can't even find the person that can write it and like Robert Musil said it really holds up a lot of this stuff like a lot all of this stuff with literary prizes and 
you know, even the Nobel Prize, you know, Booker Prize, whatever all this stuff is, the National Book Award, or the, the MacArthur Genius Grant, or really any of this stuff, anything tied to an institution has a very high chance of being completely ridiculous. And uh, just as kind of like a offhand point, I, I have thought about how easy it would be to create a literary renaissance. So let's imagine that a writer is able to sustain themselves on poverty level wages, which for some people would be generous. As Moosel said, you know, relatively well-known cases of beggars. So if, so if, for example, the average wage in America is $50,000, there are a lot of places you can live for less than that. And, you know, if you're really inclined, putting $5,000 up for a literary prize each year wouldn't be that difficult. The most difficult part would be reading the books. Um, and soliciting good submissions. And when you think about how little that's cared about, I mean, yeah, there are scholarships, yeah, there are these random prizes here and there, but all it would take would be some wealthy person, you know, probably the, the literary equivalent of launching a Tesla into space, playing a, a David Bowie song with a miniature Tesla on the dashboard. You know, for example, buying, buying an, a, a house in some city and just um, having a couple of your friends read submissions from people who you send out to and, uh, you know, making them jump through some minor hoops to show that their commitment and then you know, they check up with you and you pay them, you, you give free room and board in a, in a nice city, whatever, you, you pay them however much you want. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take much. With how many millionaires there are, you know, what, you pay these writers $30,000 a year for, for nothing, give them a place to live. You know, what, what does that make? You have 20 writers. It's under a million dollars. Of course, that would be every year, but you know, a billion dollars is a thousand millions. So, um, yeah. It's, uh, because really, a lot of these literary renaissances uh, coincide with something trivial as someone being rich. Like the Italian Renaissance, the uh, English Renaissance, uh, the modernist period where there was immense wealth inequality. For example, Otto Kahn, who was one of the art patrons of Hart Crane, which reasonably anyone who's read a biography of Hart Crane, it's almost a definite fact that he wouldn't have finished it as quickly as he did without the donations by an obscenely wealthy banker who didn't deserve the money he had, but in getting it was able to help Hart Crane out. So um, yeah, it's really quite a tangle when you get there. Um, going on a different point, I've been rereading a lot recently, and um, kind of what go got me going on that track is, well, I, I reread almost constantly, but really like focusing on rereading is, I've read a lot of really disappointing contemporary books, and it's wasted my time doing that finishing contemporary books, and uh, so I went back and started looking at the recognitions again, because it's, it's been on my mind since I read it, and I went back and started reading The Lost Scrapbook, uh, read my favorite bits, a couple, like, the first 70 pages or so in the beginning, and then there's a section starting around page 250 and then continuing for, I don't know, 50 pages. That's extremely good. The whole book is a, amazing, and I'm very grateful to have found it through uh, Paperbird. 
And uh, as far as I can tell, it's the most recent masterpiece. There are many good books published since then, but um, as far as I can tell that I've read, no masterpieces. And I've been reading um, Sutri. I, I almost continuously reread Sutri, which uh, coincidentally, those are my three, three favorite Mm. Yeah, I, I would say those are, with with margins, three my three favorite novels of the 20th century. I mean, there are other things that I haven't read all of yet, which is another point I wanted to get to. But you know, in in rereading these books, I I think about everything that went into them, like. The, the disposition of someone who would write these books. Uh, the Recognitions took seven years to publish. Uh, Sutri took 20 years to publish. Uh, the Lost Scrapbook probably could have come out a little faster, but I imagine it took several years at least to be as good as it is. And just the sort of feeling that the person must be in who's writing these. Um, which just as like a nice anecdote today, I, I was at my pharmacy and this lady came in dropping off prescriptions for her friend who had had a terrible fracture, is how she described it, and uh, talked, talked about the flu and all this stuff because it's a quite bad flu season this year. And I talked about, yeah, I see, I see kids at my university and, uh, you know, I see them coughing on their hands and kissing each other and, and holding each other's hands and, you know, basically licking doorknobs. And, uh, it always, it's always so striking to me sharing food. And, uh, she asked me what I study and I said English and, uh, apparently she was an English major and, uh. So we kind of talked about that and it was just really nice because you could kind of tell I like tapped into something that maybe she doesn't talk about much because uh, I told her just kind of openly like, yeah, I'm taking a Shakespeare class and it's my favorite class this semester. And she, <laughs> she like kind of like nodded and like, oh, I love Shakespeare or whatever, you know. And then I kind of went further and said... Uh, Oh no, she asked me, yeah, like, what are you reading? And I said, well, we're reading uh, The Merchant of Venice now and The Jew of Malta, and then we just read Midsummer Night's Dream. And she, she went on to say uh, how much she loved Midsummer Night's Dream, and you can tell she kind of, um, you know, keeps up with art. I think, well, I don't want to say where she was from, but she was from a more mm, art focused area. Not in Texas, anyway. She was here visiting and. Yeah, it was very interesting. One thing she said, she seemed to almost be embarrassed that she got a, an English degree. And she like couched it in the idea that she thinks that appreciating humanity is more important than a lot of other things. And I think it's very disappointing that that's something that has to be a defense for anything. Because uh, I've, I've heard similar sentiments at, at my school, just in passing. Uh, business professors have the highest earnings, as an example. I heard, a, I heard a kid who was getting a finance degree. A finance degree. Um, basically saying how worthless history and English degrees are. A finance degree and you could tell he was talking to someone who was less confident than him and he was just like you know blasting and I just wanted to step in and just really lay into him but it's worthless you know obviously he probably would have started to fight me or something but you know I, I just think 
you know, out of all the things you could do, do you really want to spend your life learning paper tricks or, you know, how to shuffle rich people's money around? Is that really what you want your life to be? And this is a bit harsh, but I'm not making a universal judgment. It's just my personal judgment. Uh, every day when I walk to my classes, I have to walk past the the Geosciences and Petroleum Engineering Building. And um, as I read that to myself, I thought I would rather be deaf and blind than study Geosciences and Petroleum Engineering for any amount of time. And <laughs> I know that's a bit harsh, but that doesn't mean other people shouldn't like it. But I would hate it immensely. And, um, you know, I can imagine someone asking me, well, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be easier to do something like that? Wouldn't it be easier to be a lawyer? Wouldn't it be easier this, this or that? Yeah. And if I wanted an easy life, <laughs> I would have an easy life. <laughs> Being born in America, speaking native English, it's not hard to choose an easy life. Yeah, you can't control luck, but come on, you know. So, um, yeah, in that way, uh, it's just unfortunate in general. It's unfortunate. Okay, and kind of in that way, um, I, I take a generally fatalistic view of a lot of things. Not in the, like, apathetic sense. Because apathy is boring. There's almost nothing worse than being boring. In many ways. But, uh, yeah, so, so as far as the fatalistic sense. So, it seems to me that... People can't choose how creative they are. People can't choose how intelligent they are. People can't choose the string of books that got them stuck to literature. And it all seems to me that those, those factors among many very much affect what what any what you can do with your life so speaking in more precise terms um, I know some people try to be creative and or original you know that's really the, the more I think common formulation of it trying to be original trying to make something new and uh, I've, I've, when I was younger, I was more like open to it, like, uh, whatever, you know, but now I'm almost convinced it's very stupid. Uh, I can still be convinced otherwise, but the reason I think trying to be original is very stupid is, um, it's, it's like that common joke where, um, when you were in middle school or high school, whatever, all the people who wanted to be different looked the same. Like the, uh, the, uh, goth people or the, uh, you know, wh whoever you want to pick. All the people who went out of their way to be different. Like, like if you want to be different, you get a tattoo. That, I think that's like the old formulation of it, maybe from like the eighties or something. It's not really true anymore, but it's, uh, you know, if, if you want to be different, you get gauges in your ears. Or, if, you know, you're different wi with other people. So I think, you know, if, if someone sets out, oh, I want to write something different, you'll be different like everyone else. And I think the only possibility is, is just a pure emanation of, of whoever the person is. And that, that's really the only chance of it being unique. You know, if uniqueness is considered a positive trait, which I think it fairly safely can be, 
can be one positive trait of a work. Uniqueness never, you know, well, I can't say that, but for, for intelligent and discerning readers, uh, uniqueness never hurt a book. And, uh, Let's see. Wanted to go somewhere else with that. Yeah, so when I think from myself, from from speaking from my own personal perspective, when I when I think about what I'm writing, you know, if I'm writing or when I think about whatever I'm doing at each moment, it doesn't matter how good I think it will be because it it will be what it will be. And, uh, you know, that is fairly simplistic, but there was this amazing scene in Phantom Thread where um, the guy's making a dress for uh, this woman. And uh, he makes a comment like, you know, how, how nice the fabric is. And then she says, you know, I don't really like the fabric. Or, no, he says, like, isn't that a nice dress? And she says, you know, I don't really like the fabric. And then the the sister says, the sister of the, the dress designer says, you know, it's, it's a very good fabric. All of our customers like it. And the guy says, she's right. And she's not right because the customers like it. She's right because she's right. <laughs> you know, it, it's a beautiful fabric. <laughs> and then go, goes on to say other things. But the, the main idea of that scene is, you know, a book isn't good because people like it. A book isn't good because it won an award. A book is not good because it's written by someone who comes from this or that place. A book isn't good because it's any of those trivial things. A book is good because it's good. And I, I tried this experiment the other day. Um, I went to the library after class, and I went up to the sixth floor, which is the most of the literature. Like oh, They have French, Italian, German, uh, American, English literature up there. And so I went up there, I went to the American section, and I went to the section that's like basically authors born maybe like 1900 to 1950 or so, like birth, birth dates. And I started at the back, I started at uh, like Bowman, you know, William Bowman and all these, and uh, I went through all of it. I went through Z to A, you know, looking at every, you know, more or less every book. It took me a, couple, a few hours, but my, my experiment was, can I find interesting books by the title or how they're presented? And it's more difficult when you're in a library because you're only seeing the spine. And um, I took into account, like, how, how used it looked like how, how used the spine looked, if it was bent a lot. Uh, I took into account the color of it. I took into account like the publisher, if I happened to be able to see it. And um, I found one interesting book out of all of that. Well, I knew a lot of the interesting books already. Like one of the really interesting ones if you come across uh, Darkenville's Cat by Alexander Theroux, you'd have to think it's interesting. You th Darkenville's Cat, that's a very interesting title. It, it's a slim book. Uh, in the hardcover edition, it's slim. And it has weight to it. It's black. You open it up. And the first line is good. It's, it's a very interesting book. But I had already heard of it. And uh, this, this happened quite frequently because I, I wouldn't necessarily read the title before I got an impression of the book. And I ran across, you know, William Gaddis. Um, a whole bunch of other people. But the interesting book I ran across is actually a book that doesn't even have a Goodreads profile. 
it's uh, it doesn't really have a title either, but it's the collected works of Adrian Eric Mitchell, who was born in 1963 and died in 1986. He was killed in a car accident, <clears throat> and he was a, a master's student at Columbia University. He uh, he was an American, and he was studying classics. And I couldn't find any information on this book anywhere. It looks to me like it was, you know, it was actually published. It's a very nice edition, a hardcover book, nice paper, well printed. But um, the preface is written by one of his professors at Columbia. And then there's an introduction written by someone who never met him. I'm assuming one of the friends of the preface professor. And it says that uh, his family... Uh, like connected with the professors, see if he could get it published, all this stuff. But the book is very interesting because it's a 23-year-old guy, and I'm about to be 23, so a lot of our sentiments overlap. And he, he wrote in an interesting style. He wrote in like an older style, uh, like an older affectation, and a lot of his stuff is very interesting. Um, and the only reason I picked it up is because it says Eric Mitchell... 1963 to 1986 on the spine, a black spine. The only re that's the only reason I picked it up. And uh, I think I think that's because it was in the aisle of Cormac McCarthy. Pretty sure it was. But uh, yeah, and just reading about him, he he always tried to be. You know, kind of like uh, he tried to be interesting. Um, and it was very interesting uh, how the professor wrote about him because I've tried to interact with professors here and they basically don't care that you exist, more or less. Which is, you know, you, you wonder why they're, why they're even teaching. But this professor at Columbia clearly appreciated this guy, and uh, enjoyed him in class and all this stuff, and he has very interesting ideas. One of his ideas that I thought was particularly interesting is, um, if there is actually a God, there can be no free will, because all of, all of your will that could be free is accounted for by the God's will. Uh, the only way you can have free will is if uh, there is no controlling power over the universe. He says it more eloquently than that, but that's the general idea, and I thought that was interesting. I'd never really thought of it that way before. Um, yeah, and I read that whole book that night. But that's kind of one thing I wanted to go into also, is uh, the idea of like finishing books or reading books, which I think is valued too much valued way too much, especially in the Goodreads culture. But uh, I've always been on the edge of thinking finishing books barely matters. Like, that's that's my general disposition throughout my life. I, I think it, it hardly matters. And sometimes I, I err on the, the edge of finishing books is worthless. <laughs> Not even that it hardly matters. Like, that's... You know, in that way, you'd be like, oh, you might as well finish it. But I, I think often, it depends on the book, obviously. Some books are throwaway books, and you don't even care whether or not you finish it, so you might as well just finish it. And I don't really mean those books. I mean the books where it's extremely important to finish it, so you don't. Whether because the author left it unfinished, or it would be silly to finish it because to finish it, it would necessitate you skipping things that you should spend time on, something like that. Because, uh, you know, I've read the first 250 pages of The Man Without Qualities maybe four times now, and I haven't ever gotten past it. And it's for no particular reason, but I can easily say that this is one of my favorite books I've ever read. And... You know, I can imagine at first glance for an unsympathetic listener, they could say, oh, you haven't even read it. You know, how can 
you say it's valuable or something like that? How, how can you say it's meaningful to you? Which wouldn't take long to be seen as an extremely stupid statement. But I think finishing books or reading books, as in I read it, is, you know, at best naive and at worst like vain and you know, like people who who rate Finnegan's Wake five stars and say, I haven't read it. It's like, okay, okay, bud. But I, I think in that way, you know, finishing books is extremely trivial for for the books that actually matter in the end. Um Because, you know, I can say I've read Sutri or whatever, but I've read it twice now, and I don't ever plan on stopping reading it. So, in that way, I must not have read it. Because, you know, if if I've read it, then I wouldn't need to read it. And uh, I still read it, so I must not have read it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. But it's true because um, I was I was thinking in this way with uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem and completeness theorem, and I can't say I understand it completely, but uh, it's a very interesting hole to go down reading his biography, the logical dilemmas, because he was. 25 when he came up with his completeness and incompleteness theorems which are you know extremely brilliant even if you only glimpse what he means with it uh, but it's the idea I think there's almost nothing nothing more beautiful than an unfinished perfection and I think in fact those are the only things that can be perfect or unfinished things you know and that that includes the idea of hope kind of but it's also a, a tragic sense a tragic sense of hope because um if if the perfection is impossible but your only hope is the perfection of it, it it's somewhat tragic uh in the way of mathematics uh, it's it comes from the you know like this sentence is false So just the fact that that cynics can exist, it it makes something unusual. But um, also thinking about the law of excluded middle, which is something that Gödel thought about a lot when he was young, which is the idea that um, the law of excluded middle is that uh, something is either, can either be proven true or proven false. And that's generally been revised to be it can be proven true or it uh, can't be proven to be true and uh, you know I think that's very interesting just in the in the uh, context of mathematics and logic where where it is a quite shaky idea compared to this can be proven true and this can be proven false you you end up with it can be proven true or it you know, it can't be proven true. It's impossible for it to be proven true, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily false. So, um, and uh, in this essay by Musil, he says, uh, as a general idea, you know, he talked about the idea of the uh, serious writer, and then he goes on to talking about today how we actually have no idea what's going on today. We, we can have no idea because we're in it. We only know what's going on, you know, in, in the past or maybe 20 years past as you start to have a good idea. And um, Musil wrote, published the first volume of The Man Without Qualities 16 years after he said it. He said it in... Uh, 1913, right? Has to be. Yeah, 1913. It starts in August 1913, yeah. 
and uh, he published it in 1930, the first edition of it, first part. So uh, he must have had some idea of that. But one line in there in this essay is, we err forward. And it is a sense of optimism because he brings up the idea that, well, we haven't failed yet. You know, there is always the chance of chronic uh, decay in human culture where where the right people don't get put in the right spots and the the mass of people just drags everything down, more or less. And that's that's always imminent. It 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 can it's always around the corner, but oddly enough, we've kept it going for a little while. At least, you know, five hundred years on this string in the West. Which is a pretty good string, all things considered, when, when you imagine what could have happened easily. So I, I think he has some a valid point there of this optimism. I've been listening to Steven Pinker a lot and some Jordan Peterson stuff, but Peterson gets a little too mystical and weird for me, but Steven Pinker's more my style of optimism, I suppose. Looking at graphs of violence going down, looking at graphs of poverty being uh eliminated, uh, you know, diseases being taken care of literacy going up, people being more educated, the Flynn effect, all this stuff, you know. It is it is intellectually optimistic. I mean, not that itself, but it does make one more optimistic intellectually. But uh, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature, so... Um, yeah, there was more I wanted to say, but 42 minutes is completely long enough. So, yeah. Hope you, hope you enjoyed. Uh, death is a gang boss.